Welcome everyone on a Tuesday edition of the Damage Report. No, I'm not yelling. No, I'm not all excited. No, I'm not giving you all kinds of energy because I have very limited amounts available for me today. I woke up as if you couldn't tell wildly sick this morning, but I've come back in mostly for you guys. 95% for you guys, glad you guys are here. The other 5% is for my guest, his name is Michael Schur. Long time contributor to the Young Turks, a brave man who steps out at Trump rallies and talks to people and asks them what the hell they're thinking. And many times he gets no answers. We're gonna get to that, but first, Mike, how you doing, brother? Good to see you. I'm doing okay. It's weird that I'm a guest. I feel, you know, but I guess I'm a guest. It's uh, home, uh, brother. Yeah, I feel like I'm at home, a guest in my own home. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like coming home from college, I guess. <laughs> uh, Your right. room is the, the way we left it. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> uh, no, uh, uh, good to be here doing this with you. Uh, and uh, good that John's doing something that he ought to be doing. So that's great. He absolutely should be doing it. Uh, what I would like to be doing is breathing better, but uh, I'm gonna give you guys a heads up. There's this thing you should concern yourselves with. If you have a child and they go off to school, cause school just started and they come home and they seem perfectly fine. Don't believe them. Matter of fact, if they're showing no symptoms of anything, act like they're sick because that's what happened to me. Child came back, he's perfectly fine. He's having a great beginning to his middle school time. And instead this all goes down as if we were in preschool before. I'm bitter, I think you guys can tell. Fine, let's just get to some of these stories though, you guys. We've got a lot to talk about, especially since it is now 9-12. It's September 12th, you guys, just yesterday was 9-11, as we could probably imagine, which I generally avoided all kinds of tributes and talks and discussions that people were having surrounding the 22 years since 9-11 did go down. There's a lot going down, let's start here. I join you on this solemn day to renew our sacred vow. Never forget, never forget, we never forget. Each of us, each of those precious lives stolen too soon when evil attacked. Never forget is the message on 9-11 as we already know. Uh, the reasons the reasons being, maybe we wanna make sure things like that don't happen again. Or maybe we'll protect ourselves from things. Or maybe the response to it maybe shouldn't have been what it was. There's all kinds of things you can go through, but definitely the memorial of the folks who we lost on that day, President Biden started with. And it's a, a typical line many politicians to push and it's standard. And it's uh, quite welcome to many Americans. Ron DeSantis even, presidential candidate tweeted this, X'd posted, who knows? He said 22 years ago, 19 terrorists took 2,977 innocent lives in the deadliest attack against America in our history. We will never forget, we shouldn't, then what? Next, Chris Christie, another presidential candidate on the Republican side. 22 years ago was one of the darkest days in our nation's history. We can honor those that we lost with our love and our deeds. The day before, I was named US Attorney for New Jersey. My wife and brother were within blocks of ground zero. This day is personal to me on many levels. There's something, Chris. He says, we can honor these we lost with our love and our deeds. There's something, I appreciate that. Sometimes I think we forget what is that we can still be doing as far as honoring folks that we lost on tragic days like that. Then uh, former President Donald Trump, he had a statement. Check this out. No one who lived through the horror of the September 11th terrorist attacks can ever forget the agony and the anguish of that terrible day. It was a terrible day. The images of dark plumes of smoke billowing over lower Manhattan, the Pentagon and a field of Pennsylvania, such a beautiful field, are seared into our minds forever. We will never forget. Donald Trump is definitely a major on going off script here and there. Maybe it works out for him, Mike. This stuff he also said before on the day of, we bring that back a lot. And there it is at least a somewhat of a normal statement. First, your thoughts, 9-11, the tributes, do they stick much anymore? We're gonna get to how many ways we've departed from that. But how much of a tribute and type of, of I guess, memorial day did you feel yesterday, Mike? Well, I mean, you know, you think about it and you remember it. And I think that's what's supposed to happen. I, I you know, I, people, if you're from New York, you either know directly or tangentially people who uh, lost lives or loved ones that day. I certainly did. And I think of them that day and I send texts to their families. And, you know, but I, I don't think that it, you know, I think it's not that it fades. Uh, and it certainly hasn't fade for them. But there's, you, you're not required to do more than, than, you know what what you're comfortable doing, which is thinking about it. And um, I, I don't know that there's a way to 
honor that other than to, you know, kind of think of their memory and 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 rue that day. Yeah, because many people, of course, could imagine themselves in that position and how terrifying it'd be. But also, it's like why people always say, I remember where I was when I found out when I was watching what was happening. I'm never going to figure out where I was. I feel like yeah. I say that every year, uh, even as I was, you know, still in college out here in Los Angeles. But then across the country, you see this going down and you wonder, where is this going? Um, so, of course, the fallout from it, things going out since. Very many political things actually happened from it. Uh, you know, where there's lots of legislation and fights happening over taking care of the first responders on that day, those who passed and those who still suffered afterwards. We've seen all those stories happen. And uh, as, as far as talking about whether or not it fades or not, I, I remember seeing some comedians in previous years recently talk about it. I think those types of things are going to pick up because as we get further and further from things that we all saw and experienced, there's gonna be more and more people that were like, oh, I kind of remember that. I was five when that happened. And those are the folks that are the adults at the time and maybe start veering off from the normal thought processes. But one thing that still bothers me sometimes is when politicians like to use it in what we would think is a serious manner, like Ted Cruz did here. Because when politicians want to use 9 11 for a chance to promote themselves politically, it never comes off well. Let's go to Ted Cruz. I worry that we have forgotten the lessons of 9-11 and what security looks like. We've done it at the airports and we've kept that up, right? Yet we have this wide open southern border. Yeah. We have a vulnerability on our southern border every month. People are coming across who are on the terror watch list. The numbers dwarf the number of known terrorists who would come in prior to Joe Biden. If you're the next planner of 9-11, it's obvious where you go. Yeah. You go to Mexico and you come right across and Joe Biden and the idiots in his administration will fly you to wherever you want to go in this country and you can carry out your terror attack. And sadly, every day that we have an open border under Joe Biden and the Democrats, the odds of another major attack in this country, major terror attack go up systematically. There's uh, no shame with Ted Cruz. So of course, he's using uh, the tragedy of 9-11 22 years later to talk about if you're a terrorist, you're gonna come through Mexico. As a matter of fact, take a trip through Mexico and Joe Biden's gonna buy, put you on a plane and send you wherever you wanna go to attack Americans. I, I, I'm trying to find if there should be even one person that would raise their hand and be in support of something like this being said, just for the sake of what he's predicting could and would happen because of Joe Biden being in office. Completely forgetting the fact that there was this Republican that was in office when 9-11 actually did happen. And since then, for some reason, anytime there's a Democrat that touches the office, we've increased our, our, our possibilities for this happening again. Did it increase when Trump was in office when you were kissing his ass after he dismantled you throughout the primaries? Yes, he actually did, but those things aren't gonna be said because he's a, a creature of politics. Um, there's other guys, but specifically Ted Cruz bugged me, man. Uh, one more thought on this, uh, 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 Mike. Does this get him anywhere? What does he gain from this? Because Ted Cruz is consistently on the side when he has something to say to folks and he gets lambasted on, on X. He gets uh, he gets pushed back and, and uh, uh, he gets fact checked on things that he says. But he ends up looking like the bad guy every time. What's the mindset here? Well, I mean, he's running for election next year um, for his Senate seat. And you can cut through all of what he says to look for two words. And the two words are the words that he wants everybody to hear, and that's open borders. The borders are not open. But if he can say open borders enough, uh, enough voters are going to think that the borders are open and enough people who don't pay close attention are gonna assume the borders are open. That's the only thing he cared about in that whole tirade he just went on. It's not excoriating the president or his staff or his policies, it's saying open borders. And then people repeat it. And, and that's the danger. The borders, as we know, are not open. If they were open, you wouldn't see you know, you know, hundreds of people every day standing at the wall, trying to, at the gates, trying to get in, standing, uh, you know, crossing rivers to have to get in. It's it's absurd to say that our borders are open. Uh, it's just a thought. I wish 
politicians, no matter what uh, political side of the aisle that they're on, would actually be thinking about ways to remedy these issues. Maybe nip it before it gets to those points. Instead, it's talking about whether or not we can go with punitive or just uh, uh, blaming other folks for everything that's going down and how it affects uh, folks in this country and how we also facilitate these types of things that we say we're against. There's more though, Madison Cawthorn, haven't heard this guy's name in a while. He decided to stick his head out because apparently he hadn't been attacked in a while for ridiculous things that he had also been saying. But here we go, here's a, a tweet he put out, if nothing else, to at least honor the folks and the families that lost folks that day. It says RIP to the 2,996 Americans who died on 9-11. And RIP to the 1.455,590 innocent Muslims who died during the US invasion for something they didn't do. Which um, I can see the point being how we attacked another country and killed a bunch of innocent folks. We do that all the time. And I wish there was this kind of pushback for the folks, the innocent people that we then see on the back ends of many attacks that we have. Which again, was why so many folks were vehemently upset and against the Iraq invasion, what the Bush administration was doing, W was doing back then. But I mean, I have to be honest, it's weird how some folks in the Republican Party have switched a little bit to the. His, his quote there was, where were you when the world stopped turning on that September day? The lies were fed by the elites have defined the entire 21st century. Never trust your government, never. Um, I guess he's full boat against entire government. He's not saying specifically Democrats or anything, it's the elites. Which I think a lot of times from a, a conservative's mouth, they're again talking about partisan politics. One more since we're gonna go to the left side here. Progressive author and former youth pastor John Pavlovitz. He received backlash when he tweeted, if you don't grieve both 9-11 and January 6th, you aren't patriotic, you're partisan. Again, man, you can have your thoughts all you want. I just don't know why we have to always say it. That's all. Take about, I think there's a, there's a, 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 some people had like a Twitter or now an X type of thought process. If you're about to tweet something that you think might be uh, razzing people up, Maybe wait five to 10 seconds and read it to yourself three more times before you actually do it. Just for the sake of not having to deal with the pushback from it. Cause sure, you can be, I'm thoroughly upset about January 6th. I do think it was an attack on our country. I do think they're trying to overturn democracy. I do think they were out to murder and kill people. And then some folks resulted, end up dying as a result of it. So it is a horrible, tragic day. Let's remember 1 6, let's remember 9 11. They're two separate events and they're both horrific. Let's do something about what we did in response to those things. <sighs> Lastly, though, uh, uh, here's Shirzy. Yeah. Maybe because you're a New Yorker. But this was the biggest problem I think many folks had. DraftKings, who's uh, an online betting sports bookie, which I don't engage in whatsoever. Um, what they've uh, posted was never forget, this was their promo for 9 11. Never forget, bet these New York teams to win tonight on 9 11. We got the Mets to win, we got the Yankees to win, or the Jets to win. But one of those I know for sure did happen as everyone was watching. And the fallout was immediate. And then they responded with this. We sincerely apologize for the featured parlay that was shared briefly in commemoration of 9-11. It was brief though, Mike. We respect the significance of this day for our country and especially for the families of those who were directly affected. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe I, I would be one of the few people, I guess, that was like, "Oh, look at DraftKings doing this. That's kind of, that's kind of cringe." But then move on. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm not taking it heavily enough, Mike. Your last thoughts, bro? Uh, yeah, I don't. Uh, I mean, it's kind of silly. The the Yankees were rained out. Also, the Mets lost. Um, the right. Jets won. I, I think, uh, yeah, it's silly and. They, somebody realized that it was silly and they apologized for it. Yeah, some sense like, is this one of the things that holds on to DraftKings now and it follows them around and people stop using the service? I, don't like, think, I mean, so they realize, I think people, first of all, you're not gonna stop a gambler from gambling. It's like, oh, I'm not gonna gamble now because these guys did something that was uh, inappropriate. There might be a handful of people, but I don't think there are a lot. I, I, I don't know, it doesn't matter. I think, you know, I think, Remembering 9/11 is appropriate. It's, it was a horrendous day, and you know there are enough people alive today who remember it very well. That how can you not at least pause for a second and think about what happened? But uh, but again, we will need promos. What's that? <laughs> we don't need promos. Don't I think promos. maybe one thing. Uh, we definitely remember. Uh, let's go to this next story though, Mike, because there's this guy who's involved with it. And I think he's a fabulous correspondent. I think he's very articulate. He asks the hard hitting questions. Uh, there was a MAGA rally in South Dakota uh, over the weekend. Our one Michael Shore showed up there and he asked some of the rally goers a few questions. Let's see what they had to say. 
What is it that you love about Donald Trump? Donald Trump is honest, open, and he's just like the rest of us. He's also been indicted on four different counts. Does that, in your mind, disqualify him at all from running? Well, you know what? It's questionable, but it's honest when he honest when he answers honestly. Okay, and you, sir, I, same question. Hell no. I've been indicted on a whole bunch of counts. I'm a good person. I love America. I don't know if he does, but I believe he does. Well, a little bit of honesty there. Michael Shore there showing up at the near this Trump rally out in South Dakota over the weekend. And there are some honest answers there. Apparently, the first lady there says he's honest, he's open, and he's like the rest of us. Um, He's like the rest of us in which ways? I guess her uh, her friend there, husband, boyfriend, companion, brother, who knows? They were on uh, their honeymoon, by the way. Oh, they're on their honeymoon and they went to the rally. And who, go, who doesn't go to Rapid City, South Dakota on a honeymoon? It just screams honeymoon uh, and then a Trump rally, bingo, exclamation point. I mean, there's two check two boxes, Shirzy. I mean, the honeymoon is off to a great start. Let's make sure yeah. that the room is right. Make sure a Trump rally is nearby. Maybe a continental breakfast in the morning yeah, as well. Nice. <laughs> you never know. But there was talks about how honest he is. Really fast though, graphic one, because uh, this has been found out and discovered a long time ago. Everyone knows this, maybe she didn't. But there was a final tally of lies that Trump told. Analysts say that Trump told 30,000 mistruths. About 21 a day during his entire presidency. Uh, so that was the approach that apparently she thought he was honest. But then she said he's just like the rest of us. Pause for a second because we have a lot of problems that people have with diversity, equity, and all this in our country. Whenever a black person, Latino person, Asian person, someone is in a position where they are qualified for, but they also prioritize the fact that this person represents certain folks in this country that don't have representation. Uh, many times, MAGA folks say Donald Trump is just like us. Matter of fact, the Giuliani's and Trumps of the world say if they can do it to us, they can do it to you. There's a lot of representation talk being uh, thrown back and forth between these groups because it's important. But for some reason, it's not important to other folks. And it's shunned and tossed to the side and said that you're just bringing up people for the sake of their skin color. There's a big part about the connections that people have with Donald Trump. Many times it's the same like-mindedness. Sometimes they like that they're connected to how he looks. It's representation, but we have a problem with it when it's anyone else. Even based on the fact that he's up on all these damn charges and you still think that he's an honest guy. A little bit more, Mike asked him about whether or not Trump could end up on Mount Rushmore and if they agree with that. We're near Mount Rushmore here in South Dakota. Uh, do you think there should be another president up there? <laughs> Maybe there's one there that should be replaced. Maybe put Trump up there and place a Teddy Roosevelt. Why? Teddy Roosevelt was a progressive. We're right near Mount Rushmore. Do you think uh, he should be up on Mount Rushmore? God, no. No, <laughs> no that's for the four. <laughs> yeah. Is there a president you'd like to see up on Mount Rushmore? Mr. Trump. Is there another president you think should be up on Mount Rushmore? Um, I would say Trump. He wants to fight for the people. Is there another president you think should be on Mount Rushmore? Uh, JFK. Why? Because he wanted to abolish everything that was wrong with America, the CIA, all the uh, alphabet letter, FBI, all that. He's a rock star. Apparently a lot like Donald Trump. Some background on those folks there, Mike? You were right there. Uh, I mean, um, you know, just uh, out on a Friday evening, taking from the sights. Uh, I, look, listen, I, you, you get a lot of the same types at these places. It was, the, what was interesting was that there was a decent amount of frankness from the people who were like, nah, let's not go there. I don't think Trump should be up there. But, you know, you got one JFK. But anyone who did specify a president or said that there should be someone else up there, it was 100% Trump. Uh, it was 100% Trump and it was anyone else. I mean, I think they kind of saw the, where that question could be going because also Donald Trump has talked about it kind of, sort of, because this is what he said before uh, CNN's uh, Chris Saliza pointed this out. He says, every single president on Mount Rushmore. I'd ask whether or not you think I will someday be on Mount Rushmore is Trump. But here's the problem. If I did, jokingly, totally joking, the fake news media would say he believes he should be on Mount Rushmore. So I won't so I won't say it, even though I just talked about it. <laughs> For a minute straight how I should be there. But still, that's Donald Trump, we know how he operates. But still, one more thing. It wasn't all Trump about Trump at this rally though. Michael asked the people that he talked to 
Uh, what would they ask President Biden if they could ask him one question? We've shifted from the love for Donald Trump, but then maybe some honesty and some answers from one Joe Biden. Watch this. If you could sit down with President Biden, tell him one thing, what would you tell the president? Do you know what flavor Jello you're having tonight? You got one question, what would you ask him? I'd ask him, where is he right now? Because I don't think the guy even knows where he's at. What would you ask the president? Probably ask why he's still in office. I don't think he's mentally fit to be president in the first place. What would you ask President Biden? I'd say who's really pulling your strings. Simple as that. If you could ask Joe Biden one question, if he was standing right here and said, sir, how are you today? Ask him, ask me any question, what would you ask him? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Maybe the best answer of all of them, Michael, I gotta be honest, because how do you really know what you'd ask a president, a sitting president office when you'd have no idea what the day to day is like? We just go off what we see and hear and it's pretty obvious what they've seen and what they've heard is that they should be asking them, you must be disoriented, you must be spinning in circles. There's been two or three different instances that I've seen from Fox News shows that misrepresented what uh, President Biden was saying and doing in a moment just to show or to create this illusion that there's this confusion. Now, by the way, Joe Biden is an elderly man and has had his moments uh, being where he gets lost in what's happening or maybe even doesn't really know. I think they mentioned something like a, uh, someone was on vacation. These things I think are somewhat normal as a person goes, but I don't think it means that he's now uh, missing, uh, maybe not reading briefings like this former president did. Maybe not paying attention to things that are happening. When someone gives some advice, he goes, no, it's gonna be me and instead and nobody else is gonna think this way. It's just whether or not you're competent enough mentally and have any kind of uh, any kind of issues with that, uh, that's something that can be determined. But the fact that there's this belief system people have completely bought into based off of what they've heard in blurbs and on Twitter and whatever else that they've heard on social media, that becomes their standard belief system. You can have your thoughts, your assumptions about the way someone is, but they are standard and they know just what it is in their own minds, Mike. Uh, was that like the common type of uh, response or was that just a small sampling? Yeah, I mean, it, it was uh, it was pretty much, I mean, whenever anybody said like, like that last gentleman who didn't want to say anything, didn't know the answer, you could tell that they just were biting their tongues because they wanted oh. to say the same thing. Um, <laughs> there was nobody who gave a really thoughtful substantive, uh, hey, um, do you want to rethink giving money to Ukraine? Do you right. want I mean, there was, there was absolutely no, you know, did, you know, could should we continue drilling uh, for more oil, which is a sentiment that they all share, and they blame Biden for gas prices. That there was nothing about substance. It was all the guy doesn't know where he is, you know. And so, um, but you, you know, what I always say about these rallies is when I go to them, and I've been to several now, is it, you kind of just open a vein and let them bleed. You don't, you don't. You know, egg them on. You really want their honest answers, as astonishing as they sometimes are. You just give them the form to to do it. On a scale of one to ten, how much do you enjoy these interviews? Um, you know, um, it, it the interactions, not the fact you have to be there and like the process of going through all of that. What you're doing when you're interacting is just being friendly too. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not I'm not there for gotcha. I'm not there right. to. Kind of be antagonistic, and you know, if somebody uh, one rarely because this audience doesn't watch this programming, but this time they're actually somebody knew what TYT was because they ask where you're from, and this time somebody knew what TYT was, and they said we're traitors, we're frauds, we're mm -hmm. what's wrong. American, everything. I don't even get in with those people. I, I the, the the back and forth and the chatter is interesting, and then I'm glad it's over. My very last question is I always want to ask Emma this when she's been to some of these. Have you ever sensed any, as people you said the first time, or maybe the first few times, people know you from TYT and they call you traitors and everything? Um, any nefarious thoughts or behavior like, oh, yeah, you better get out of here, bro? You know, stuff like that? No, never. I mean, you know, when I was on the road with Trump for about 15 months in 2015, 2016, uh, I was with Al Jazeera. And because Al Jazeera at the time when he was talking about a Muslim ban, right. there's a there's a equating of the two. I got a lot of that uh, then. I mean, I shouldn't say a lot. I got some of that then. Mm -hmm. uh, but not, um, you know, I had Al Jazeera on my microphone. But no, nothing. I've never felt threatened. Okay. I, these people are really out having a good time. This is not a rowdy bunch. These people. It's like tailgating for a football game. In, in fact, it is. I mean, we've talked about that before. These people are really excited and happy to be there. And then you go to a, we went to dinner afterwards, Zephyr, the producer. 
and I and you know people who had been at the rally were there, and they said, you know, just simple people who just were, you know, the a lot of them. Oh, that was really fun. We got to see a president. He was <laughs> terrific, and Christy Nome was great. And but you know, we left early because he just kept talking. You know, so it's <laughs> it, it's it, the majority it's just what they believe that's astonishing and and depressing. But you just kind of plow through. And I think that's by design. The football nature of it, the tailgating nature of it, the the, the fact that now Democrat Republican is now you know the the Commanders versus the Cowboys. You know, yeah. that's the way it is now, and that's based on the way people will, will vote. They'll be like, oh, that guy he can't throw first. 35 yards down the field, I'm voting against them. So right. that's the way this whole thing works now. I've gone over time, let's take this first break, you guys. A few of your thoughts, if I can pull up that document that I've not pulled up yet, but we'll do that in a second and hear what you guys have to say. But when we get back though, there's more developments in the Supreme Court a, a, a corruption case surrounding Clarence Thomas and his wife, Jenny. It's what you probably assumed, it's just more information is coming out, which we're gonna do absolutely nothing about. We'll see you guys in a second. I am an ordinary citizen from Omaha, Nebraska, who just may have the chance to preserve liberty along with you and other people like you. Over the last 30 years, I have worked and struggled inside this Washington Beltway waiting for you people to show up. As a committed conservative from Nebraska, for the US Chamber of Commerce, for Majority Leader Dick Armey, for the Heritage Foundation, Hillsdale College in Washington, and other places. Now I have felt called to the front lines with you. There's Jenny Thomas, wife of Clarence Thomas back in 2010. And this was a few weeks after Citizens United ruling loosened some restrictions on our systems that allowed all these folks to flood more money into people's pockets so they can continue to be even further corrupt than we already knew. By the way, at that speech, she was never even introduced as being Clarence Thomas's wife, but everyone probably knew, the people who needed to know, probably knew who it was. And this all leads to this new report that shows that in the months before the ruling dropped in January of that year, a group of conservative activists, including the Federalist Society leader, Leonard Leo and that Jenny Thomas there, worked on many ways to exploit the upcoming ruling for their own benefit. Yeah, it's that deep, let's get into the details. This is from Politico. So Jenny really wanted to build an organization and be a movement leader, said a person familiar with her thinking at the time. Leonard Leo was going to be the conduit of all of that. She also had a rich backer, Harlan Crow, in case you guys didn't, in case you guys forgot that guy's name, the manufacturing billionaire who had helped Thomas and her husband in many ways, from funding luxury vacations to picking up tuition payments for their great nephew, Harlan Crow, Leo, Leonard Leo, and Jenny Thomas. Keep those names in mind as we go through all this, because at the time we point out Citizens United was going through the courts and they then loosened all those restrictions on it. And there was also a timeline put together of the big collusion and efforts that they put forward to make sure that they took advantage of what they saw coming and what they knew they could rule on as it came to benefit them. We'll just go through it really quickly, we can put up the graphics. But they started with those oral arguments that were concluding on Citizens United in September of 2009. We can jump down to that second graphic of these whole things. And by 2021, they had shifted they had shifted nonprofits, they had shifted this one political movement to the next. To make sure that these things were covered up. We can go through all the details of it, but it'll take you about 15, 20 minutes. The, uh, the, the way that this was put together now that it's being exposed seems pretty direct and blatant. And probably was, but no one pays, was paying much attention to it because it's Supreme Court justices that are potentially involved in this. There's money being exchanged hands that is involved in this. We don't touch them, they're above the law. Matter of fact, they're gonna govern and they're gonna police themselves. And we're seeing how that's working out in very bad ways. Here's some more details of what is that did happen and all that though. This is the overall goal of this corruption between those groups, graphic four. A billion dollar network of groups, most of which were registered as tax exempt charities or social welfare organizations, taking advantage of gaps in disclosure laws. They shield the identities of most of their donors and some of the recipients of the funds that was changing hands. Among those who've been paid by the groups are leading thinkers and individuals with close personal ties to Leo. That included a whopping $7 million to a group run by a close friend and his wife. They also include a for-profit business for which Leo himself is chairman and which received tens of millions of dollars from his nonprofit work. So they found a way to keep laundering this money and circle it back and forth to different groups and themselves. And of course, benefiting themselves and their friends. A little bit more, here's other ways that they were also exploiting that ruling. Two months before Citizens United decision went down, but after the justice had signaled their intentions by requesting new arguments, attorney Cleta Mitchell, 
later to play a role in Donald Trump's false claims about the 2020 elections, filed papers for Jenny Thomas to create a nonprofit group of a type that ultimately benefited from the decision. Jenny Thomas, wife of Clarence Thomas, who was of course part of that whole ruling. And this group was called Liberty Central. And after Liberty Central went public, it provoked an outcry over Supreme Court Justice's wife promoting causes like overturning Obamacare that were before her husband's court. Leo and Thomas changed gears once this was put on blast. And his network reactivated a dormant group, the Judicial Education Project, which would go on to become a major supply of amicus briefs before the nation's highest court. So they're pushing their agenda, Michael, uh, consistently in different ways, putting their names behind one thing or hiding their name in another, or making sure many folks didn't know that Jenny Thomas was a part about all these things. But still, what we'll hear constantly is, look at this rigging of our election system. Look at how the uh, these Dems are trying to take over our court systems. They're trying to change and transform America from what we know it to be into what they want it to be. The hypocrisy is off the charts. Well, it's off the charts and it continues. Mm -hmm. Investigations into Clarence Thomas and his wife are not going to stop because just because of the fact that she wasn't indicted in the January 6th indictments. She wasn't, Cleta Mitchell wasn't indicted as one of the co-conspirators in Georgia. These people are still being looked at, reported on. And what happened with Harlan Crow, even though Justice Thomas addressed it, uh, is that's not gonna go away. So you have journalists and you'll, you'll have activists who are gonna go after uh, Jenny, Jenny Thomas and Clarence Thomas until these things see the light of day. And that's what's so great about this reporting is that it goes back to 2010 and it uncovers the beginning of that kind of a conversation. It's, uh, it's, it's stuff that is, um, is really important uh, because it talks about how the court is uh, composed. Leonard Leo, by the way, was someone whose name came up very often with Republican presidents to be a Supreme Court justice himself. So there is this sort of clash, this tiny cabal of people who think that way, who sit in a pool waiting for a Republican president to name them to the bench. I'm not saying it's a whole lot different on the other side, but it's a whole lot different on the other side. Yeah, that's gonna be the case. And also there was also discussions and pushback and denials from Harlan Crow saying that, you know, we never discussed things that were gonna be in front of the court when I was hanging out with Clarence Thomas and his family and taking them on lavish vacation and all being buddy buddy. You don't have to talk about it, you just have to provide the money and then make sure that everyone benefits from those rulings and he does his job on the back end of it. Who says you have to talk about it? We know how these whole things work. We got a few minutes, let's jump to this next story. I love these congressional stories, Michael, when you're on because I like to get your insight on exactly how or what you think Matt Gates is up to here and how serious he is, let's watch. Matt Gates is just speaking into the wind. He's spe- if just look at McCarthy's slot. He's not slow walking anything. That clip there from Brian Kilmeade on Fox News was something that Matt Gates, Republican representative Matt Gates, then ex tweeted, posted out in talking about Kevin McCarthy. Oh, he's coming for Kevin McCarthy. Matter of fact, Matt Gates, this is his tweet he put out, which Swalwell, uh, Representative Swalwell responded to, but first Gate Gates. Uh, he quoted what he was, what uh, what um, Kilmeade was saying, and he said, "Hey Brian, where are the single-digit appropriations bills? Where is the subpoena for Hunter Biden? Where is the Mayorkas impeachment Kevin was gaslighting in December and January?" And he keeps saying, like, asking for a friend. So he's coming for Kevin McCarthy and not standing up to all these things, standing for all these things that he promised he would do as Speaker of the House. Uh, Swalwell responded, said, "I've never seen a colleague make more empty." threats day in day out than this guy talking about Matt Gates. Gates folded like a cheap card table to make McCarthy speaker and will never, I repeat, never make a motion to remove McCarthy. I do not work with serious people. And Matt Gates of course responded because he's been called out and he said, hi Eric. <laughs> if I make a motion to remove Kevin, how many Democrat votes can I count on asking for a friend? So as I asked you, Shirzy, here's one more question. What does Matt Gates want? Really fast, this is what media was talking about, what Matt Gates had said. I worked very hard in January to develop a toolkit for House Republicans to use in a productive and positive way. I don't believe we've used those tools as effectively as we should have. That means forcing votes on impeachment. And if Speaker McCarthy stands in our way, he may not have the job for very long. Crazy how that works. And maybe it goes to Swalwell's point that Gates may say things like this, but then again, would he ever actually do it? Because I've got breaking news. I'm not sure if you heard this. Graphic five, because after all this, I guess, pressure. 
McCarthy is apparently going to endorse a, a Joe Biden impeachment inquiry, and that sets up a possible vote for it. And again, he's quoting um, uh, that James Comer and Jim Jordan have come up with enough evidence to then look into more details of Joe Biden's background, finances, their families, interactions surrounding Hunter Biden that they've been talking about ever since Joe Biden even started running for president. So the question then becomes, is Kevin on his way out or is he protecting himself now, Michael? Well, he's definitely protecting himself here, but it could mean that he's on his way out. He has too many different factions to please. And and look, I mean, he's somebody who likes power more than he likes using power. So holding on to it is very important to him. And he is really a, I would say, beholden to the right flank of his party. They ask for something and he does it. He would not be speaker, did he? Were he not to have gotten those votes in early January, and it took a long time to get them. Then he got them, and now he's got to hold himself to that. And so, what Matt Gates is saying, whether you like Gates or not, is actually true. McCarthy promised certain things that that group hasn't gotten. They gave him what he needed then, so they're demanding it now. He is delivering on at least that vote. We'll see if what a difference it makes. But by doing that, he alienates the majority of his caucus. So it's a very, very difficult tightrope for Kevin McCarthy. He wouldn't have done this had he not, of course, checked with with other members of his caucus who are more moderate. But again, there's not a lot of moderation in that caucus. I mean, it's the gift of having power to speak of the House, but it's the curse of consistently having to deal with stuff like this. 15 votes, I think they held up. Am I right? Sure, held up 15 votes when he yeah. was trying to get in there and then made these concessions. Yeah, I think it was 17, but maybe you're right. I, I will say it was 15. Uh, it's not always a hard job if you are able to keep your uh, caucus united as as uh, as Nancy Pelosi did, as John Boehner was able to do for a while until this Freedom Caucus thing started. Uh, it, it, it's doable, it's just that when, when these people like to fight more than they uh, like to legislate, then you're, you're in trouble. Well, I, I wonder, cuz Swalwell's kind of pushing, I think he's igniting it more and be like, you're not actually gonna do something because maybe he wants this to then make them look as bad as it potentially could. But then again, we'll see what'll happen. I've said it many times that Joe Biden, uh, has done stuff which they have not proven at all yet. Show, show me. All right, um, which and I'll accept. Uh, let's take this break though, you guys. A few more of your comments, but then also when we come back. There's this madness going around. I tend to talk about Vivek Ramaswamy. He's back in the news. He's got more things to say because he's making more names for himself. We'll do that. We'll do a lot more when we get back. Anyway, goes. We got a few minutes left to go, you guys. Um, uh, uh, really fast, Shruzy, because I have to know. Yeah. Um, Giants, Jets. Have you had a bad weekend, my fellow, my New York friend here? It's really fast because I'm enjoying the beginning of this football. I think season. you know who my team is, Jr. That's a good team. <laughs> Rangers. <laughs> Rangers, 49ers. Goodbye. Let's. <laughs> We'll see you in the NFC West. All right, let's go on to this uh, next. By the way, my Rams are one to know. We blew out the Seahawks. Just saying, just keep track. Um, let's go to this next story, you guys. A lot going on in the political world. Madness ensues. Let's go. I was born in the United States. He was a birthright citizen of the United States. Would also be deported. In that yes, case. that's correct. There are legally contested questions under the 14th Amendment of whether the child of an illegal immigrant is indeed a child who enjoys birthright citizenship or not. They're contested. That was very strong stuff, outlawing birthright citizenship. What justifies that? So if you have entered this country illegally with the intention of using and having a child here as a basis for establishing citizenship in this country, that is not something the 14th Amendment was designed to protect against. And Stuart, if you want to get on the legal scholarship side of this, a kid of diplomats who's born here definitely does not qualify for birthright citizenship because there are qualifiers in the 14th Amendment. It says you have to be subject to the laws and jurisdiction thereof. I think we have to treat people with respect, with dignity, but we're a nation founded on the rule of law. That means that if you come here illegally and have kids, birthright citizenship should not extend to the kids of illegal immigrants in this country. Vivek Ramaswamy is making some more waves. He's challenging anything he can. It's not like it's a brand new thought process, but he's now he's going after the 14th Amendment and for some loopholes that he's talking about and making sure that you know children of migrants that show up to the country, if they're born on American soil, that they would automatically be American citizens. We've seen this argument go down, especially with conservatives, especially when it comes to what our migrant issues down at the southern border. So they're very upset, and Ramaswamy thinks he's found. 
pot of gold to strike from in his run for president. Uh, by the way, as far as the 14th Amendment, it wasn't intended to quote, protect against immigration the way that they're pointing out. It was actually to prevent Confederate insurrectionists from serving in public office. Also to protect the right to vote and this particular issue in this point, protecting non-white Americans from abuse by federal or state governments is what they're now talking about. And there's more as far as the Dred Scott ruling as well. Here's a little bit from the Constitution about the 14th Amendment, that one document. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and the state wherein they reside. A little bit more, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty or property without due process of law. Nor deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. We know how madness uh, that statement was at the time when people weren't considered uh, equal citizens then. But you know they ignored that part. Maybe Ramaswamy wants to bring that part up a little bit more. But still, he specifically mentioned that the subject of the jurisdiction thereof at the beginning of that point in the Constitution means that there's a loophole there. Like most amendments, there was ambiguity that left room for interpretation. But this is the situation. All those questions were eventually settled in the 1898 Supreme Court case, United States versus Wong Kim Ark. Essentially, the court said that the common law concept of just soli should be applied to the 14th Amendment. I'm sure I've mispronounced that. In other words, the 14th Amendment excludes children born to diplomats or hostile occupying forces and those born on foreign public ships. Those are some of the very narrow restrictions that most legal scholars agree do not exclude the children of legal immigrants from receiving automatic citizenship. So Shirzi, I'm sure you've heard these discussions for about the 14th Amendment and ways that they can reinterpret how it is to fit our changing times now. Is Ramaswamy in a spot here where he can do that? I mean, I don't think so. And I don't think it's politically prudent as someone who covers politics, just knowing that there are a lot of um, first and second generation Latino voters who are now showing, I would say, interest in the Republican Party in ways that the Democratic Party is not anticipated. And this is a way to push that out because many of them are citizens because of that law, because of the law, because of the Constitution. And if the party embraces that as a platform, it's going to alienate many more people than it will invite. And I also think that this is Vivek Ramaswamy getting attention with, you know, I liken him to other candidates, some you've heard of, some you've not. Maury Taylor back in 96, maybe even Andrew Yang last time. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, the sort of gadfly candidacy that, that hangs on to one or two provocative ideas and then goes ahead and, and runs a campaign on it. And not to say that all of his ideas are bad. I don't know enough about Ramaswamy, but certainly not everything Yang said was off the charts, but a lot of it was and it didn't get him any kind of uh, traction as a candidate other than as a fad candidate for a while, which is what I suspect Ramaswamy will be. And I also don't think that any of the eight people that were on that stage are gonna be the nominee. I think it'll be Donald Trump and if it's not Donald Trump, it will not be any of those eight. I think. It'll be somebody else oh. who will emerge, a governor, maybe Brian Kemp. Really? Yeah. Or, or huh. I hadn't heard that theory. I actually kind of like that because I never understood who it is that could possibly. You usually have a general idea. And obviously, Trump is forefront here, but you know, a lot yeah. of things happening with him, you should absolutely never know. Uh, really fast though, because I'm no constitutional scholar, how would that even work? And I'm not asking this as a challenge, uh, Shirzi, maybe you do. But if Ramaswamy's talking about, uh, miss different interpretation of, the, of that amendment and making sure that we do things differently. Is that something the president sitting in the White House can just declare from his desk? No, it wouldn't. I mean, you'd have to. I mean, it would be changing the Constitution in essence because it's a false uh, interpretation, a faulty interpretation of what the Fourteenth says. So, I it, it would it would require a constitutional amendment. It wouldn't work. It's it's food for thought um, for and it's red meat for those people who think that there are too many citizens here. But defining illegal is very difficult as well. And if you are uh, an asylum seeker, as the first people who came here uh, from the United Kingdom were, then or at that time. England, um, it, it's uh, it's very difficult to define what is illegal and what isn't. Then everybody would be out of here because we're all related to illegals. It would only actually be people who were brought here uh, who, who can trace their lineage back to slaves who were brought here against their will. Then who would uh, who would have, you know have citizenship? In Ironic how that works. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's, which, which I think leads to the same point. Ramaswamy saying things to get attention, but then. 
why is it when we hear someone who's running for president say all these things, if it doesn't make sense for how life would actually work, why that becomes something that you think they've won a debate for, that they have some actual points of view. Well, I, I it's supposed to end in, in actual policy, you think. But within, a, within his, within that world, he's, it's not that he's won a debate, but he's staked a claim. And whether or not it's viable, uh, this is always going to be Ramaswamy's thing now for the rest of this race. And it's going to be something he's both going to have to answer for. And maybe there's some people that are, you know, there may be a lot of people on the Republican side who think that that's a great idea, but um, it, it doesn't I mean, it, 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 there's an ease of it happening. It's just somebody in embracing his thoughts. But I, again, like all he did is stake a claim. And if 12 people agree with it, then that dilutes it uh, as far as a Ramaswamy issue. For sure. Um, as far as the, maybe he's looking to get some attention from the folks who listen to folks like Tucker Carlson, who had a much more violent and aggressive approach to what he thinks should happen with uh, migrants down at the southern border. Let's watch what Tucker Carlson had to say. How many Texans do you think are all on board with letting 7 million people cross into their state illegally? What percentage? Zero, zero. I don't care what your race or national origin, nobody is for that. That's insane. Has the governor of Texas done anything meaningful to stop that? No, the Republican governor, he's got a national guard. He's the commander in chief of the national guard and it's Texas. So they're all large and they have double stack magazines in their sidearms. You think they couldn't stop that in a week if they, of course, just assemble along the border. We're not, we're not doing this. What are you doing, man? Don't you have a national guard? Why don't you seal the border? Oh, it's very complicated. No, it's not. No, it's not. If someone's trying to break into my house, it's not complicated to repel the person. Do you have a firearm or don't you? It's pretty obvious what Tucker Carlson says he wants to see happen down at the southern border. And apparently the border of an entire country is like your front door as well as your back door of your house. And maybe you should put a ring camera on a wall. Who knows, that's easy enough. It's all the same thing, but Tucker Carlson is speaking to a group of people who want some red meat. And of course, he's talking about how they have double magazines and biggest guns than anyone else in the world. So why don't we just start shooting people that approach the border? How about that? That'll be easy. Cleanup is really just nice and, and trim on that. Again, but he's criticizing Governor Abbott, the Republican governor down in Texas who absolutely has zero love for any migrants or anyone else that is looking for life, liberty and happiness, specifically Texans is who he is against. Here's a couple of things that actually have been going on under Governor Abbott who Tucker Carlson is upset at. It says from border security to sadism, report claims that Texas DPS told to push migrants into the Rio Grande. Is that de deadly enough for Tucker? I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Here's another one, body found trapped in Greg Abbott's anti-migrant buoys along the Mexico, Texas border. Um, I, I don't have the details of how uh, the person who passed away ended up in those buoys or what the governor's response was or the state itself. But I get the feeling it didn't make much news because that's one of the few times I've heard about it. But still though, there's folks like Marjorie Taylor Greene who want an even more radical change from this. I'll let you get on Tucker in a second, but let's just read this tweet. X from Green. If the Biden administration refuses to stop the invasion of cartel led human and drug traffic into our country, states should consider seceding from the union. From Texas to New York City to every town in America, we are drowning from Biden's traitorous America last border policies. So, how would, I mean, I guess we've asked this before, Shruzy. We got people that want to secede and they're not serious thinkers. They're just saying this for more red meat. But, Tucker, how about those thoughts? Look, I mean, I, Tucker's speaking into um, you know an empty room at this point because he's not on Fox News, and mm -hmm. and and we know that very few people hear him. So he goes to these things. He says these again, trying to uh, elicit reaction. These uh, you know going into Texas and also spreading falsehoods. There are not seven million people coming across the border in Texas, so they do these scare tactics to try and get those people riled up to think that in fact because they like to march to somebody's drum that he's the drummer they're going to follow and and so again i i don't it it the impact is that enough people hopefully will understand that there are not open borders and 7 million people are not going to come in and that birthright citizens and citizenship is in the constitution that there will be these rabble rousers but it'll stay exactly where it is for now it'll stay there but then may they still be upset that it stays because of course they believe the rabble rousers they believe the violence and they believe in wanting to do more as far as those things go because if nothing else is happening and they call out people who are unbelievably conservative like Greg Ab Abbott for not being conservative. And that's right. the astonishing part. That's some of the most scary parts because who's next, who's worse? 
They'll find them, they'll find them. Uh, it's, it does it for the first hour here for you guys. We're coming back though for the aftermath. For members, of course, uh, hang on for a few minutes. We'll come back at a couple minutes at the top of the hour and go through a few more stories, including Drew Barrymore. Oh man, she's in some trouble considering her show has crossed the picket lines. We'll do all that in a second, we'll see you in a minute. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.